March 13, 1875, Lyons Weekly Mirror, Lyons, Iowa. A Magician Puzzling London. For some time past, we have been amused in London by the presence and ingenuity of two rival conjurers, Dr. Lynn and Mr. Maskelin. They outdid one another in marvels and are found to occupy rooms side by side at the Egyptian Hall in Piccadilly. At last, Dr. Lynn came out with a clever but ghastly trick of cutting a man's head off, but Mr. Maskelin, not to be beaten, has invented a mechanical contrivance called Psycho, which is a marvel among automata and already the talk of all London. Psycho is a human figure resting on a square box or case literally filled with clockwork and elaborate machinery, and this case, with the dummy figure or doll resting upon it, is placed on a glass cylinder in the center of the stage. It is absolutely impossible that a man can be concealed under the figure to work it, as was the case with the once celebrated automatic chess player. The box under Psycho is extremely small and completely filled with machinery of an elaborate kind, but at the command of Mr. Maskelin, Psycho adds figures together, multiplies, subtracts, and performs various astounding feats in mental arithmetic. He is also able to tell what cards have been subtracted from a pack by several people in the audience. But the most marvelous trick performed by Psycho consists in his playing a hand at whist with three gentlemen selected from the audience. When the cards are dealt, Psycho's cards are arranged in front of him on a semicircular frame. The cards played are called out by Mr. Maskelin and, when Psycho's turn comes to play, the figure looks wise, turns his head, puts out his hand, and selects the necessary card. He plays an excellent game, never revokes or makes a mistake, and the feat is rewarded with the most unbounded applause. Mechanicians are wild about the discovery, which reflects great credit on the ingenious skill of the inventor. Psycho was first introduced down at Sandringham by express order and command of HRH, the Prince of Wales. London Letter May 5, 1875, The Carol Herald, Carol City, Iowa Exposure of Psycho, the English Mystery The correspondent of the Cincinnati Commercial writes from London, The mystery of Psycho has been discovered. You may remember that Psycho is the wonderful automaton exhibited by Maskelin the Conjurer, which for a long time has been puzzling the brain of scientific men by its accurate playing of whist. That Psycho was in some way connected with and guided by a human brain was, for a long time, certain, but as it was completely isolated on the top of a simple glass cylinder and no possible connection with anyone behind the curtain conceivable, it grew to be our greatest mystery. The great men of the Royal Society went to examine it, but all were beaten. But finally, a young American, W. H. Coffin, son of Dr. G. W. Coffin, a celebrated American dentist in London, after five visits, hit upon the secret, Maskelin himself being unable to submit his figure to the test proposed. The solution is that Psycho is worked by the condensation and diminution of the column of air in the glass cylinder on the top of which he sits. Beneath the carpet at the bottom of the cylinder is a perforated plate of zinc connected with the operator behind the scenes who, at his will, may increase or decrease the column of air, the figure moving one way or another in accordance with the pressure put upon it. The conjurer was at first disposed to deny the explanation, but Coffin told the audience that it could easily be tested by Maskelin allowing him to put a newspaper between the figure and the cylinder. This the conjurer declined, and then followed great applause when it became recognized that Psycho, as a mystery, was at last dead, or at least had fairly reached his coffin. June 28, 1917, The Morning Leader, Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. Pioneer British magician dies, a long career. London, June 1, by mail. John Neville Maskelin was a London institution. For nearly half a century, his name has been a household word. In his 78th year, he was still hard at work, a public entertainer, a miraculously skilled mechanic, a fertile inventor, a fierce and vigorous controversialist. He was performing in public on May 1, but quickly succumbed to an attack of pleurisy and pneumonia. Since the day of Professor Anderson, the Wizard of the North, 
no conjurer, to use the good old-fashioned word which the modern magicians repudiate, has filled so large a space in the public imagination, not Bosco, Herr Dueler, Dr. Lin. Maskelin was a country watchmaker, or mender, and his curiosity was aroused by a repairing job. It proved to be the apparatus of a spiritualist. Young Maskelin became at once a repairer and a skeptic. His genius for mechanical work produced Psycho, the whist-playing automation. His digital deafness found expression in plate spinning, at which he was unapproachable. And no wonder, for his persistence and perseverance did not grudge eight hours' practice a day. Psycho was the world's wonder. The creature was cited in a Times leader, mentioned in Parliament, and used as the basis of punch cartoons. Nefarious plotters sought to penetrate his mysterious interior, but when, after twenty years in seclusion, Maskelin reinstated him, he was as mysterious and as popularly effective as ever. Maskelin made a sensational first appearance in London in 1865. Those still remembered charlatans, the Davenport brothers, were at the height of their fame. They were clever illusionists, as the modern description of their performances, and daring showmen. Their piece de resistance was a cabinet trick known to the veriest amateur today, but in the 60s, securely wrapped in mystery. The mistake of the Davenport brothers was that they claimed spiritual aid. England showed a disposition to accept them at their own impudent value, as America had done, till young Maskelin pledged himself to produce their phenomena by avowed trickery. He was as good as his word. The great reputation of the Davenport brothers was suddenly dissipated and, in the course of time, Maskelin succeeded them at the Egyptian Hall, where he stayed 30 years. With Maskelin, at the outset of his career, there was associated one cook who was more than a chopping block for the other than a partner. Also William Morton, unobtrusively for many years the capable business manager and able, if he would, to tell much of the vicissitudes of the little party in their earlier adventures, through the provinces, the Crystal Palace, and St. James Hall, to the Egyptian Hall. Maskelin was always masterful. In the course of time, Morton went his way to become a pioneer of the suburban theater at Greenwich. Cook was pensioned off and died. His name was promptly removed. Maskelin took into later partnership David Devant, a prestidigitator of rare charm and resource, especially fascinating in contact with children. But Devant is understood to have found the music halls more lucrative and, at an advanced age, Maskelin resumed his active control of his business. He was performing daily until illness seized him. Maskelin always asserted that the matinee was copied from his scheme by theaters, by Irving, in fact, who remarked upon the good business done in an afternoon at the Egyptian Hall and promptly tried the experiment of a matinee at the Lyceum. So it may be, but there is a more interesting point of contact between the men, for Irving, also in the interests of theatrical engagements, addressed himself to the exposure of the Davenport brothers, I believe, in Manchester. Throughout his life, Maskelin was possessed by a passionate hatred of so-called spiritualists. His encounter with the eccentric, if that be the sufficient adjective, Archdeacon Colley, is well within memory. Archdeacon Colley challenged Maskelin to reproduce certain phenomena, and especially to produce a spirit from the side of a man. This the conjurer did triumphantly, but the thousand pounds glibly offered by Archdeacon Colley was not forthcoming. The quarrel was continued in the law courts. More recently, Maskelin contested the claim of some youngsters to have copied his box trick successfully. Technically, he lost the case, but he contrived to keep the secret of his own box immune. Maskelin used to say that he had made two fortunes. That which he lost, he probably sacrificed to an impulsive speculation at the time of the Diamond Jubilee. He acquired an immense warehouse in St. Paul's Churchyard, undertaking to raise it to the ground, to use the vacant space for an immense stand, to rebuild the warehouse according to specifications, and to hand it over to its original owners, a well-known firm of drapers, at an agreed date. It was all to be done with the quickness of one of his conjuring tricks, so indeed it was, but he lost heavily on the deal. <laughs>